These are the names of just a few of the famous and infamous women who worked toward and fought for a woman's right to vote. Women across the globe organized and marched. Many were tortured. Some died for a right that too many ignore today. The struggle was long and hard fought, and though there have been great gains, full equality remains a dream unfulfilled. Susan B. Anthony was an abolitionist before she worked to get women the vote. She was arrested in 1872 for voting in Rochester, New York, where she lived. She was convicted, but refused to pay the fine. She worked tirelessly for women's rights and, together with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, arranged for Congress to be presented with an amendment giving women the right to vote. In January 1878, Senator Aaron Sargent whose wife Ellen was a feminist and a friend of Anthony, introduced the bill that would later become the 19th Amendment to the United States Constitution. It failed. The bill calling for the amendment would be introduced unsuccessfully every year for the next 40 years. In 1838, Kentucky passed the first women's suffrage law, which allowed voting rights to female heads of a household in rural areas. However, they could only vote in elections deciding taxes and local boards of the common school system, a movement started by Horace Mann in 1837. It wasn't until 1848, a full 10 years later, that the first Women's Rights Convention was held at Seneca Falls, New York. The seeds for the event were planted years earlier when Elizabeth Cady Stanton met Lucretia Mott at the 1840 World Anti-Slavery Convention in London. They were not allowed to speak or to vote, instead told to sit in a roped-off gallery. That experience inspired Stanton and Mott a Quaker, to form a society to advocate the rights of women. They met for tea with fellow Quakers Mary McClintock, Martha Coffin Wright, and Jane Hunt to plan a convention which would discuss the social, civil, and religious conditions of women. It was there, in Seneca Falls, that the women's suffrage movement was born. Then came the Civil War. Women in the northern states were already working outside of the home, but the beginning of the war expanded the role of working women. It was the first time women became school teachers, and though they were not allowed to be nurses, as the conflict between North and South raged, they filled that need as well. In 1861, the federal government created the United States Sanitary Commission, allowing women to go into army camps and hospitals, assisting in operating rooms, dispensing medicine, cleaning, bandaging, and feeding soldiers. The women were nicknamed Florence Nightingales, and the most famous of these battleground volunteers was the angel of the battlefield, Clara Barton. As for fighting, though they weren't legally allowed to, some women passed themselves off as young men, since the physical exam consisted only of checking on the condition of the teeth. Women also were spies and smugglers. At the end of the war, women went back to being mothers and wives, but now they recognized their worth. A woman's role was changing, and there was no going back. With the end of the war, 
The American Equal Rights Association, inspired by Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, began the fight for suffrage for women and African Americans. Lucy Stone joined Stanton and Anthony to address the New York State Constitutional Convention, encouraging them to include suffrage, but she failed to persuade the audience. That same year, the three women traveled across Kansas to speak in favor of a state referendum for suffrage. Once again, they failed and the referendum is voted down. A year later, the 14th Amendment is ratified and for the first time, gender is mentioned in the Constitution. It declared that all male citizens over 21 years old should be able to vote. At this time, the suffrage movement, which had advocated both African American rights and women's rights, splits apart over the 15th Amendment, which would give the vote to African American men. Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony did not support the 15th Amendment because it did not give the vote to women. They formed the National Woman Suffrage Association, while Lucy Stone, Julia Ward Howe, and Thomas Wentworth Higginson led the American Woman Suffrage Association, which did support the 15th Amendment. On the governmental front, Small strides were made with both the Utah Territory and the Territory of Wyoming granting suffrage to women. But for every step forward, the 1880s saw the suffrage movement take many steps backwards. The suffrage amendment was defeated two to one in the U.S. Senate, while the Washington Territorial Supreme Court struck down the law enfranchising women in the Washington Territory. The Edmunds-Tucker Act then took the vote away from women in Utah. The reason? Polygamy. Meanwhile, Rhode Island became the first Eastern state to vote on a suffrage referendum. It did not pass. Toward the end of the decade, women in Kansas win the right to vote in municipal elections, and though women continued to fight for their rights, they continued to live their lives. Well, women's lives were so busy. Um, in the 1800s, it took a full day to do the family wash. And suddenly, inventors started realizing, most of them men, but not all, um, they started realizing that there's a market for innovations for women. And so late 1800s, early 1900s, you start to see this blossoming of household innovations that really aided women's lives and gave them the leisure that they needed, in this case, to organize for suffrage. One woman, El Dorado Jones, had been a stenographer, a teacher, and an American inventor nicknamed the Iron Woman. She opened a factory in Moline, Illinois that employed women over the age of 40 and invented an airplane muffler, a lightweight electric iron called the Joyful Iron, a travel size ironing board, a collapsible hat rack, and an anti-damp salt shaker. At the trial run of her airplane engine muffler, she is described as puffing upon one cigarette after another. The New York Times said she was energetic, self-reliant, and had a, quote, general distrust of men, end quote. That distrust made it hard for her to manufacture and sell her muffler or to do business with men at all. Her obituary read, Woman inventor dies in poverty, and ends with a quote from Jones. Do not forget to exploit men all you can, because if you don't, they will exploit you. By the 1890s, the two separate suffrage groups merge to form the National American Woman Suffrage Association, headed by Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Opposing the suffragettes, the New York State Association Opposed to Woman Suffrage, founded in 1895. During this time, the focus on voting rights turns to working at the state level, 
And, once again, the movement meets with as many losses as wins. In 1904, the organization adopts a Declaration of Principles. In brief, we demand that all constitutional and legal barriers shall be removed, which deny to women any individual right or personal freedom which is granted to man. This we ask in the name of a democratic and republican government, which, its constitution declares, was formed to establish justice and secure the blessings of liberty. Women really didn't have that much uh, say over their lives. Um, things were gradually starting to change. Um, states were gradually enacting laws that allowed women to have property rights, allowed women inheritance rights, etc. Used to be, you know, 200 years ago, if a woman inherited um, property from her family, from her father it would be, she would immediately pass that over to her husband. He would become the one who would control that property. So um, there was not much control over their lives. As we moved into the 1900s, women were still tightly corseting. Uh, that was the desired figure, was an hourglass figure. And uh, what the corset does is that it, it shoves the lungs upward in the torso and takes the stomach and the uterus and shoves it down into the pelvic cavity. So it's hard for women to catch a, a deep breath of air. So you couldn't participate in sports. Most activities women couldn't do because they'd have to take their corsets off and that was not considered acceptable in society. But when we are moving into the 20s, we see women rattling their cages and um, they want to be freed. And as we move into the 20s, the corsets come off, the skirts come up, um, and women start participating in all aspects of life. Men perpetuated the notion that by granting voting equality, women would be less feminine. And if they couldn't stop a woman from voting through laws, surely her fashion would prohibit her from entering the voting booth. As women picketed and pushed for the right to vote, they were cast as masculine and man-hating. Well, that was really... Um some of society's depiction of how women were going to look after they got suffrage, as they, a lot of people viewed that women were going to be um, masculinized. In fact, there is a political cartoon of the dad staying home with the kids and the mom wearing a suit going off to vote. So um, that's how some people viewed what was going to happen to society when women were able to vote. Some women could break free and uh, uh, have some control over their lives, but uh, in general, wealth did not, was not a distinction of power for women. Um, in fact, in some ways, it maybe was less of a, a distinction because these were the society women and they had to adhere to the society rules. And that meant if you lost your husband, you were in mourning for at least two years. Um, couldn't look at another man couldn't even think about getting married again, whereas your husband, if you died in six weeks, his mourning period was over and he could go out and look for a new wife. This desire to be a full citizen wasn't only happening in the United States. The movement took root all over the world, from Washington, D.C. to England, from New Zealand to Australia. Women were on the front lines advancing the cause of suffrage. Here in the Quad Cities, the movement was more understated. It's interesting in the Quad Cities area because in doing research for this, I discovered that the Iowa, Illinois women were not that vocal about their desire for suffrage. You'd see small articles in the paper, but you're not seeing anybody coming out on the front page and demanding suffrage because of the uh, German population here. And suffrage was so tightly um, connected to the um, anti-drinking movement that the um, people in the Quad Cities saw suffrage as dangerous, that it was going to put the breweries out of business, that, and that the Germans wouldn't be able to get beer anymore. And that was an important drink for beer, um, Germans because in Germany, that's what you did. You didn't drink the water, you had beer. And um, it would have been a huge change for them to have um, prohibition enacted. So women were 
more quiet here in the Quad Cities going about their business. Um, they would still have, there was I believe one parade in Davenport, and I believe like the National Parade in Washington DC, the men stood around and jeered, but um, they did have a small amount of publicity, but it was a quieter movement here. But not everyone was quiet. At Palmer College, Mabel Palmer made her voice heard in her own way. Palmer College was absolutely a supporter of the suffrage movement. Mabel Palmer herself, being a doctor and a tr very highly trained anatomist uh, who taught all of the anatomy courses, was uh, pro-suffrage. And so she had put on the uh, smokestack there at the college, Votes for Women. So she wasn't out there either shouting from the street corners, but in her quiet way, that was being announced. Coming into the suffrage movement, Royal Neighbors of America was a very strong supporter of women's rights. Royal Neighbors of America was um, established because women at that time were not insurable. Nobody thought they needed insurance, but the fact is that if a woman died, what was gonna to happen to her children? Her husband had the say, and if he didn't have the money, he would farm the children off to whomever. And so women wanted that insurance so that there would be a bundle of money to pay for a caregiver for their children as they grew up, so that they wouldn't get separated and tossed to the wind. One of the more famous incidents in the fight for suffrage involved a woman by the name of Emily Wilding Davison. She was an English suffragette, a staunch feminist and a Christian. She was also a militant fighter for suffrage. She was arrested nine times, went on hunger strikes, and force-fed in jail. Highly educated, she was a teacher and governess. In 1913, she bought a ticket to the 1913 Derby, seeking to draw attention to the suffrage movement. She placed herself by the fence at the racetrack, hoping to pin a Votes for Women banner on King George V's horse. She walked onto the track mid-race and was trampled by the horse named Anmer. The horse and rider survived. Davison died four days later. A procession of 5,000 suffragettes and supporters accompanied her coffin, while 50,000 looked on. Back in the United States, the fight continued, and between 1914 and 1919, great changes, if not great strides, were being made. Montana granted women suffrage, and Jeanette Rankin, a Montana suffragist, became the first woman elected to the U.S. Congress. But disagreements about strategy and tactics caused tension at the National American Woman Suffrage Association. NAWSA leaders thought member Alice Paul was moving too aggressively so she left the organization and formed the National Woman's Party. Alice Paul and the National Woman's Party began to post silent sentinels at the White House, becoming the first group to picket there. And in November 1917, the women were arrested in what is known as the Night of Terror. They were sent to the Occoquan Workhouse in Virginia. There, the guards decided to teach the women a lesson, beating and abusing them. Alice Paul went on a hunger strike and was force-fed by a tube thrust down her throat and threatened with commitment to an insane asylum. Nevertheless, Paul never gave up. By the end of 1917, President Wilson was aware that support for equal voting rights had grown substantially, and he finally announced his endorsement for the suffrage movement. It was at the same time that the United States entered World War I, and under the leadership of Carrie Chapman Catt, just as in the Civil War, women joined the war effort, gaining mainstream support for women's suffrage. What followed? Arkansas granted women the right to vote, but only in primary elections. Rhode Island granted women presidential suffrage, along with Oklahoma and South Dakota. 
In 1918, the jailed suffragists are released from prison and their arrests are ruled illegal. The 19th Amendment passes the U.S. House but loses by two votes in the Senate. The following year, Michigan, Oklahoma, and South Dakota grant women full suffrage. Later that year, the National American Woman Suffrage Association hold their convention in St. Louis, and the association name is changed to the League of Women Voters. In January 1919, the National Women's Party lights a watch fire for freedom and stands guard until the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution passes the U.S. Senate and is ratified. Regardless, it isn't until 1922 that the Supreme Court rules that the 19th Amendment has been constitutionally established. This was the good news, but it wasn't for every woman. Non-white women still had battles to fight. Native American women did not gain the vote until June 24, 1924, when the government granted citizenship to Native Americans through the Indian Citizenship Act. And even then, states passed laws prohibiting Native Americans from voting, effectively barring them until 1948. Black women had fought for voting rights alongside white women, but their fight was far from over. Back in 1865, Frederick Douglass had said, Slavery is not abolished until the black man has the ballot. And even though the 15th Amendment prohibited states from denying citizens the right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude, most southern states enacted restrictive laws known as black codes, which governed black citizens' behaviors, denying them suffrage and other rights. Furthermore, the 15th Amendment applied to the voting rights of black men only. Fifty years later, after the 19th Amendment was passed, black women still faced obstacles. It wasn't until the Voting Rights Act was signed into law nearly another half century later, in 1965, that black women were truly free to exercise their right to vote. The African American experience is, is different from the, um, the white experience, and African American women um, had issues because of their color as well as being women. Um, and there's uh, one of the African American suffragists was quoted as saying, as much as white women need the vote, black women need it even more. Hallie Quinn Brown, who headed the National Association of Colored Women, was disappointed in Alice Paul. Paul had declined to join with black women in the next chapter of suffrage, so they moved forward on their own. Leaders in the black women's movement included Mary McLeod Bethune, Fanny Williams, and Maggie Lena Walker. They worked to expand women's rights at a time when many states still denied them the vote. In the end, no matter that they stood shoulder to shoulder with white women as suffragettes, black women had to gain their rights independently. You would think after 100 years of um, suffrage uh, and being able to vote that we would have maybe come a little bit further, uh, but we are still seeing um, that number one position in businesses, uh, the president, CEO position, is still not proportionately filled by women and certainly not by African-American women. We're also seeing that women are making less money, and we also know that African-American women are making less than white women. So again, that gap for the gender, and I know for the color as well too, is not gonna close here in the Quad Cities for maybe 100 years. And while 76% of constitutions around the world in some way guarantee women's equality, the U.S. Constitution, technically, does not. On January 15, 2020, Virginia became the most recent state to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. 
bringing the number of states that have ratified the ERA to 38, or three-fourths of all the states, the proportion needed to amend the U.S. Constitution. But some legal obstacles still persist, and it is not yet law. From suffragettes and suffragists, to the Voting Rights Act, to the Equal Rights Amendment, the fight for equality continues. The organized woman movement dates from 1848, when a convention to consider the rights of women was held in Seneca Falls, New York. The committee drafting the list of women's wrongs found her grievances against the government of men to be the same number that American men have had against King George. It took George Washington six years to rectify men's grievances by war, but it took 72 years to establish women's rights by law. At least 1,000 legal enactments were necessary, and every one was a struggle against ignorant opposition. Woman suffrage is a long story of hard work and heartache crowned by victory.